Hello, everybody. How are you doing? I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, ready for some more world civilization? I hope so. Um, I don't want you to worry about the time frames on things if I skip, because it doesn't matter, because I can ask things out of time frame on a test. It's just the information. So I'm going to talk about the Middle Ages. Now it's another important um, period, which is actually before what I spoke about last week, but you need the information. So, and I can put it in an easy format and you can digest it easily and easily remember the answers for the test. I want you to have easy, good knowledge that most American high school kids forget, right? Too busy worrying about dates and particular circumstances, all right? So like I said, we're gonna get into the Middle Ages today. So uh, without further ado, let me hit to the material. Okay, first things worse. First, minimize myself. Maybe that is worse, okay. Drop that down. Start slideshow. Go to the beginning. There we go. World civilizations. And as I look at my uh, trusty calendar, this is scheduled for May the 17th. Okay, we're just cutting through the uh, quarter. It's really burning. Okay, so May the 17th. Okay, I, I, did I mention this? <laughs> you see it. Okay, so here we go. Like I said, the Middle Ages. The late European Middle Ages and the Renaissance, we're gonna learn what that means, the Renaissance. As discussed in the previous chapter, beginning about 1000 CE and for the next three centuries, European civilization underwent a revival and consolidation. So a revival means they bring something back and whatever this thing is that was popular in the past is popular again. So I remember a number of years ago uh, on a television and then it got to the culture, there was a revival of the 50s. This was many years ago. So what the 50s were to people, they brought it back. It became popular in the States. Okay, so that's a revival. And then a consolidation is when a number of things uh, come into one and form only one unit. Or at least only one owner. So a number of years ago, we had more banks in LA. We had our first interstate for one. We had... Uh, what was a capital bank? Then there was another NG bank or something. Well, uh, B of A bought them all and consolidated them all into just one owner, B of A. So that's what those two terms mean. In the towns, the new bourgeoisie continued to gain prestige and wealth at the expense of the nobility while having to defend its position against the rising discontent or anger of the urban city workers. The towns and their inhabitants were by now becoming a major feature of the political and social landscape. In the 13th and 14th centuries, kings discovered that their surest allies against feudal rebels were the property townspeople. The towns were the source of growing majority of the royal tax revenue, even though they contain only a small fraction, perhaps 10% of the European population. Whereas the agrarian villagers, which means we've gone over this term before in the first week, farming villagers, taxes disappeared into the pockets of the nobles and their agents. The towns paid their taxes directly to the royal treasury. By now, the townspeople were no longer dependents of the local lord. Having purchased a charter from the throne or the king, 
They had the privilege of electing their own government officials and levying taxes for local needs. Their defense costs, town walls were costly to build and maintain, were borne by the citizenry, not put into the devious or evil hands of the nobles. The towns often had the privilege of deciding citizens' cases in their own municipal courts. Appeals went to the king's officials, not to the local noblemen. Uh, so let me go to the sidebar, uh, 1300s. Renaissance begins in Italy. I will not ask you this question about the number. Like I said, the less numbers for you to worry about, the more you can remember actual important information. Uh, 1400s, Renaissance spreads north of the Alps. That's the Swiss Alps. Uh, again, I won't ask you about that either. This is just nice information for you to digest if you can. 1461 to 1483, the reign of Louis XI of France. 1485 to 1509, reign of Henry VII, Tudor of England. 1480, Russians terminate Mongol occupation. So sorry, Temujin. The Russians said, uh, you're going to have to go back to Mongolia, OK? Uh, 15,000s uh, or 1500s, excuse me, new monarchies, new concept of state. And this one's blocked, but I'll read it to you. The third Rome idea broached or thought about by the Russians. So all this mishmash, it's not a big page. I only have one question for you, so let me get to it. Uh huh. Whiteboard, pencil. Easy and straightforward question here. Something you can easily find. What were the source of the majority of the royal tax revenue? So go at it, easy to find. Okay, you got that? Cool. Back to the eraser. And that's pretty self-explanatory. So let's just get that out of there. Okay. Hello. Let's go. Back to the material. We stopped her at the bottom. Local nobleman. Okay. Oh, and Wani, a leash one that was 283. Okay. Next, urban society in late medieval um, Europe, right? Yeah. Okay, as we noted, an upsurge, which means an increase in peasant rebellions poor people followed the black death, which is the disease that just killed millions. So again, it makes sense. You have a disease that wipes out millions and then people cannot defend themselves. So people start rebelling and taking advantage of other folks. Uh, all of them were crushed. So all these rebellions were destroyed. Nevertheless, in the long run, the peasants did succeed in obtaining more freedoms and security. The Jacquerie of 1358 in France shocked the nobility as the peasants raped and looted, burned castles, and even destroyed chapels. The nobles took a heavy revenge, but the French and Flemish peasants by no means 
were through. Revolts occurred repeatedly through the 1300s and the early 1400s in parts of France. In England, the Lollard Rebellion of 1381 was an equal jolt to the upper classes and the king. One of its leaders was the priest John Ball. His famous couplet would be shouted or mumbled from now on. When Adam delved in Eva Span, who was then the gentle man? Delft means plowed. And uh, span is old English for spun. So what this man is trying to say, who the hell are really gentlemen? You just do bad things. And that's the true nature of man. The causes of Lollard Rebellion were complex and varied from place to place, but almost all of England was involved. And in an unusual development, many artisans and laborers in the towns joined the peasants. These urban workers had been impoverished or poor by a rigid guild system that prevented newcomers from competing with the established shops and kept pay rates low for all but the workers at the top so kind of hard to break through there right I thought. the guilds now that's another important info there the guilds were medieval urban organizations that controlled what was made for what price and by whom first form in urban areas in the 1200s the guilds were very strong by the 14th and 15th centuries their scheme in which a worker advanced from apprentice, which is beginner, learner, to journeyman, to master as his skills develop was almost universal. Most journeymen never took the final step upward. However, because the guild restricted the number of masters who could practice their trade in a given area, the guilds aimed at ensuring economic security for their members, not competitive advantage. So security, over advantage. The members fixed prices and established conditions of labor for. So that brings us to the bottom of 284. So you know what that means, folks. Back to that whiteboard. Like I said, easy peasy questions here. I should be able to stretch this to one. There we go. What followed the Black Death? Again, that's the terrible disease brought by rats. What followed this? That was, we talked about that at the top of the page. Okay. And I have another question on this page. Actually, this is question two. Scooby-Doo. Yeah, already had one. Okay, now we head on to three. Just trying to be accurate. Again, here, straightforward. I mentioned this in the reading, so this is important information. What were guilds? Okay. Let me give you a second to get that down. Okay, we're gonna roll through this roly poly style. Okay, if you got that, all right, let me go for the racer. Okay, 
again, repeating what followed the Black Death, the evil disease spread by rats where millions and millions of Europeans died. Something happened because this weakened the society. Go on. And then what were guilds? Important stuff for the town. That's all a hint I can give you. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to the material. You've got down to the bottom here, conditions of labor for. So that was 284. We have to proceed on to 285. So the labor of employees, length of apprenticeships, pay scales, examinations for proving skills, and many other things. The labor shortage just caused by the Black Death. Again, you have a labor shortage because people die. That's one way to lose workers, right? This actually prolonged and strengthened the monopoly aspects of the guild system. In some European cities, the guilds, which abhorred, which means hated, the free market, were the chief determinants of economic activity until the 19th century. Urban areas had been terribly overcrowded, at least until the Black Death. The reduced populations that followed the plague enabled or allowed many towns to engage in the first instances of urban planning. Now with less people, you can plan a city. I mean, at least a city you might like. Many medieval towns emerged or came forth from the crisis with open spaces, parks, and suburbs that made them more attractive. Suburb originally meant a settlement outside the walls of the town. Wow, interesting. Again, um, and again, a, a cramped city found it necessary to tear down the old walls and build new ones farther out. Yes, they needed more room. It's just like you living in a one bedroom and you get married and have a child and it's like, uh, I can't tear the wall down here, but I can move to a two bedroom apartment. Same uh, Kind of situation. The expanded series of defensive earthwork and masonry walls is still perceptible or understood in the maps of some modern European cities. Inside the town walls or just outside, many types of skilled and semi-skilled workers plied or did their trades, generally in home workshops, employing one or two workers besides the family members. Factories or mass employment places of production were still in the distant future. So that's not till a time off. Uh, machines of any type independent of human or animal energy were unknown. Right, we're not talking about the age of industry here. Even water and wind powered mechanisms such as water wheels and windmills were relatively rare. Maybe like 10%, five. The society and economy box relates more about medieval life, specifically that of an Italian family. Um, the rise of the Italian city-state. So you're gonna see as we go along that uh, Italy's gonna be the main point of reference here and you'll find out why. Beginning in the 14th century, a new spirit manifested or came forth itself in Europe among the educated classes. Much later called the Renaissance or rebirth. It was mainly a phenomenon restricted to the uppermost segments of society, not the poor folks. There were in fact two distinct Renaissances. One, a change in economic and social conditions, okay? Let that sink in for a minute. Two, an artistic and cultural movement that was founded on that change. The Renaissance also differed substantially south and north of the Alps. In the south, Italy, 
the intellectual spirit of the age was secular, which means non-religious, and anti-clerical, which means they didn't like the church. In the North, German-speaking people, there was more pronounced concern for religious reform and less emphasis on the assertion of individual excellence. So they were more concerned about being under God and not having this way of, no, we just got to pursue our own, um, as they say, individual excellence, okay? All right, the Renaissance began in the Northern Italian city-states such as Florence, Venice, Milan, and Pisa. By counterbalancing the governance claims of papacy, papacy is the Pope, against those of the Holy Roman Empire, these cities had gradually succeeded in becoming independent of both. Let me see if I can pick this up a little bit. Okay. Why did the first stirrings of the rebirth manifest themselves in this place in this time? These cities were rich because both of trade advantage and uh, financial genius. Okay, uh, this is not at the bottom of the page yet, so I gotta continue. Um, so, Let me see, I didn't over skip, did I? No, again, all was okay. These cities were rich because of the both trade advantage and finance genius, okay, no problem. Genoa and Venice dominated the trade routes with the Mediterranean and North Africa. Florence was the center of the skilled metal and leather trades. And with the Flemish, controlled the lucrative textile trade of much of Europe. In the 15th century, the huge wealth of the Papal court made Rome once again, after a lapse of 1,000 years, a major center of culture and art. But why specifically was Italy the leader? Like I said, we we're going to get into this. More and more in the late Middle Age, Italians were leading the way in innovations, scientific, artistic, and economic. Italians were the leading bankers, mariners, scientists, and engineers. Even the devastation of the Black Death, which racked or destroyed the Italian cities, but could not crush them. Hmm, so completely destroyed, could not. In the remarkably short time of two generations, by the early 15th century, they had returned to their prior prosperity and positions of leadership. So they came back to being powerful and financially successful after two generations, though. Right? The city-states of the 14th and 15th centuries were princely oligarchies. You're like, what does that mean? In other words, a small group of wealthy aristocrats headed by a prince with a despotic power, which means like an evil, all-powerful uh, power that ran the government. No commoners, common people whether urban workers or peasants outside the city gates, enjoyed even a hint of power. In fact, a huge gap existed between the ruling group of aristocrats, merchants, bankers, and traders, and the rest of the population who were regarded with a detached contempt. It was possible to rise into the ruling clique, but difficult. The key to change was money. Now we move on to the Renaissance attitude. Yes, we have to talk about an attitude. Yes, sir. Uh, the wealthy in an Italian city were highly educated, okay? Highly educated and very much aware of and proud of their good taste in the arts, 
led by the prince, the members of the oligarchy spared no pains or money to assert their claims to glory and sophistication in the supreme art of living well. So pretty much these people were snobs, okay? Snobby folks that were like, look at me, I'm educated, I'm well off, I love art, okay? What did living well mean to these individuals? Certain elements were a curse. So we're gonna talk about these elements, what they were. Individualism, wealthy men and women of the Italian Renaissance believed that the age old Christian emphasis on personal humility, this is something I find in the United States now, most people I deal with, especially in the big cities, don't have humility. And when I was growing up, Many people did, and they did a survey recently, and they found out that kids in an elementary school and middle school didn't even know what the word meant. That's not a good uh, prediction for the future. As wealthy and successful people, they did not fear to set themselves apart from the masses and were supremely confident that they could. Like the ancient Greeks and Romans, they encouraged pride in human potential, a thirst for fame, and a strong desire to put their own imprint on the contemporary world were the heart of their psychology. Again, sounds so much like today, where so many young people come to Los Angeles and Hollywood to be famous and to have power and do all these things, right? And put their mark and tell their story right? Very interesting. Parallel. Secularism. Increasing secularism in Italy meant that the focus of the upper class's attention shifted steadily away from the eternal. Yes, when you talk about religion, I don't care which one it is, Christianity, Islam, uh, uh, the Jewish religion. Um, they talk about going to heaven, and that's a big, big, important thing. But when you're talking about, well, I just want to be rich here and enjoy myself here, and I don't believe in God, it's a different way of thinking. So, again, their attention shifted or turned steadily away from the eternal, eternal life to worldly affairs. The life to come receded into the background as Renaissance men and women rediscovered the joys of life in the here and now. Increasingly, people view life as an opportunity for glory and pleasure. Again, different from a religious person that says, my life is an opportunity to serve God and other people. I must help other people. But these folks with the secularism said, my life is an opportunity for glory for myself and pleasure. You know. Luckily for me, I'm a pretty basic guy, so... You know, I can get pleasure from just having some good donuts or a couple of uh, tacos at Taco Bell. I don't need to. I need a Bentley. I need a hundred thousand uh, dollar, you know, Ferrari. You know, I need to be on TV. Uh, rather than a transitory stage on the way to eternal bliss. Okay, so that does bring us finally to the bottom of 285. So, you know, I got a couple of questions for you there. get that pencil or a young peel jumps in there so it's going to be question four let me make sure my numbers are correct okay let me see if i can extend this Give it a go. Good. Name the two distinct renaissances. So you have to describe the two different emphasis of the renaissances, okay? And my last question for this page, question five. Why was Italy the leader in the Renaissance? So let me stretch this. 
Can I? Renaissance is a long word. Oh, I did it. So if we need some further explanation here, it's saying why, why wasn't it Germany? Why wasn't it uh, England? Why wasn't it Spain? Why was it Italy, the leader in the Renaissance? So let me give you a few to answer those. All right, you guys having a good time with those? Good. All right, let me go for the eraser. Okay, so again, repeating, name the two distinct renaissances. They were about two different parts of society, okay? Next, why was Italy the leader in the renaissance? Again, why wasn't Italy, I mean, why wasn't England? Why wasn't Spain? Why wasn't Germany? Why wasn't France, okay? All right. So we ended here on the way to eternal bliss, which means heaven. The uh, Renaissance folks were not worried about heaven, didn't care about it, didn't think it, it existed. So we're there and that's at the bottom of 285. So we get to push on to 286. So here's a map, just letting you know what was going on at the time. So you see these little icons here, School of Art, University, and the date founded. So compared to other countries, even with a few, like you see Spain has a three, which would be universities. Look how many universities are in uh, Italy, the famous boot of Italy, right? Bang, 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 bang. Okay, so art, economics, what have you. Look at England too, Oxford and Cambridge. That's it. Okay. Okay. So everlasting damnation. So uh, that's the other side. There's heaven and there's hell. That's what everlasting damnation is. And the Renaissance folks did not believe in that either. If you don't believe in heaven, you're not going to believe in hell. Man was the measure or the yardstick, the ancient Greek model for what life had to offer. A revival of classical values. The ancient civilization of the Greeks and especially the pagan, which means like uh, some would say devil worshiping. Uh, Romans became the focus of artistic and cultural interest for these highly educated folks. Led by notable scholars such as Petrarch and Lorenzo Valla, the thinkers and writers of the 14th and 15th centuries look back to pre-Christian or before Christian Mediterranean culture for their values and standards. Okay, it says they were not anti-Christian, probably so to speak, but how can you not be, right? 
So again, this up here goes along with the photo that we just looked at. The Renaissance was limited to the confines of the old Roman Empire and left stronger traces in Italy, like I said, I pointed that out, in Northwest Europe than elsewhere. Its absence in Eastern Europe and weakness in the Iberian Peninsula, meaning Spain and Portugal, meant that the Renaissance was scarcely noticeable there. They were like, what? We're doing our own thing. We got McDonald's here. That's what we're concerned about. Uh, what major social and economic changes in late medieval Europe might have made these places the centers of the rest? Well, we just answered that, right? Okay. So again, let's go on with the path here. They were not anti-Christian, so I'm probably going to say so to speak. And um, for one e, that's the bottom of 286. We have to move on to 287. Much as, oh, so they're saying, oh, it's not that we were against Christianity. We were just pro-humanity. Humans first. In their admiration for the achievements of Plato, uh, these are, uh, Plato and Aristotle are Greek philosophers. Virgil, Terence, and countless other contributors to the pre-Christian intellectual world. The collection and careful editing of the ancient texts that had somehow survived many through Muslim caretakers. So some, as Muslims took over um, certain Christian areas, I guess they didn't uh, burn the Christian texts. Wow. This became an obsession. What the modern world possesses of the Greco-Roman past is largely the work of medieval Islamic civilization and the European Renaissance. Uh, continuing down here, there were, of course, variations of degree in these attitudes, which means different people thought different things. Even in Italy, many people soberly, means they're not drunk, upheld the medieval Christian viewpoint and insisted that humans were made for God and that the new emphasis on pleasure and self-fulfillment could lead only to disaster. I'll tell you an interesting thing. Um, if you, let's say you, because it used to be I would read books, but you know, more less and less people are reading books. So if you go to YouTube, okay, let's throw the let's throw the Christian thing out here. We'll play the devil's advocate here. Um, right, a Christian says, uh, if you just live your life for pleasure and self for Fulfillment, it could lead only to disaster. So what disaster is the Christians saying you're going to go to hell? Okay. Then you have the viewpoint of the people who are secular, like it said here, these uh, Renaissance folks. And they don't believe in God. So, that, okay, we'll look at their side where they say, you can do what the hell you want. You're not going to go to hell because there is no hell. Okay. Now, just throw those things out and say, I'll just live for the pleasure. If you go to YouTube, and you see interviews with folks that were famous for whatever, they were comedians or dramatic actors or sports people or whatever. And uh, they lived for pleasure and fame. And they experienced it, I guess, as much as they possibly could. They really tried to experience a lot. And you see them later and they'll tell you, it has nothing to do with God. It just says they're not fulfilled with life. That's an interesting statement. So even if they were like, why well, I feel like a Renaissance person, but they said, you know, after so many years, I just was not fulfilled. I felt empty inside. A young person says, how the hell can that be? Because I really, I, you know, I want to be on TV and I want to be in movies and I want to do all this stuff and that will make me so happy. And I have a $10 million house. So just listen to, you know, go to YouTube and see something like uh, Jim Carrey get interviewed now. He talks about how when he first got real, real famous for, I guess it was Ace Ventura that made him famous. And in the movies after, like Mask and different other things, he said the first time he got a check to do a movie for $25 million. He was so excited. He kept that check in his wallet for a while without uh, depositing it or cashing it. And then 25 years later or whatever, he's like, uh, doesn't make me happy. Interesting stuff. Okay. 
Many of the scholars who paged through the Roman manuscripts were devout, dedicated Christians looking for holes in the arguments of their secular opponents or for proof of their earlier pagan search for an all-knowing God. In general, the Italian Renaissance was devoted to the self-realization of human beings whose earthly lives were the only sure ones they had, right? Because people will tell you, well, it's like the old saying, uh, can you show me a photo of God or can you have God knock on my door so I can see that he's real? Because if you have nothing that I can see and believe in, then I don't think he's real. So same here. All they could say was, I just know the life that I have. How can you try to make me think about a heaven or hell? Uh, and it rejected the devotional Middle Ages as a dark interlude or dark phase that had lasted all too long. Between the light of the Greco-Roman classical age and the rebirth now beginning. Moving on to the Northern Renaissance. North of the Alps, the Renaissance was also a powerful force, but with a rather different character than in Italy. Carried to Germany and the Low Countries by students returning from study with the great Italian artists and writers, the new spirit underwent a sort of sea change as it came northward. It became more pietist and less pagan more reformist and less, less self-centered. So pious is when you're really, really respectful person and don't seek fame. So somehow this Renaissance thing was spreading up, but it was getting less self-centered and more humble. How, why, why was that? Uh, next, the term humanism is often applied to the Norman, Northern Renaissance and its leading figures. The humanists were scholars who were painfully aware of the corruption of church and society and wished to remedy it by gradualist means, meaning step by step, through reforms grounded in ancient Christian teachings. The Renaissance in this context meant an attempt to return to the church and lay society, in, which means general society, in general, uh, to, to a purer state, purer people. It was an attempt to reawaken a sense of Christian duties and responsibilities towards themselves and their fellow humans, see? And again, if you just look at that without a Christian eye, you know, the eye in your head, let's say, you say, well, what would be better for society? And let's rack that down, okay? Let's say, let's say this group of 10 people standing in front of you. If every one of the 10 people are like, hey, I'm trying to get glory. I'm looking up about myself. I don't care about other people. And then you have another group of 10 people to your left. And they're saying, well, we have Christian values. And we like to help people and make sure everybody's doing OK. You don't have to be religious. Which group is probably better for you and safer, right? More friendly. It's an easy choice. But, I, you know, I don't know. Since interesting dilemma i guess we've always had right in life in the north as well as in italy scholars put great confidence in the powers of the intellect people's mind to find the truth and employ it to bring about necessary reform the use of reason rather than dogma dogma being the bible was an important article of faith for humanists everywhere they believed that if people could be brought to see the good then they would pursue it. The trouble with the world was that good was the good that was everywhere was obscured or hidden by bad habits, ignorance, and malice. So they felt, hey, if you can get rid of these bad habits, ignorance, not knowing, and then malice or bad intentions people have, then everybody would be an angel. Unfortunately, that, that's impossible. That's like saying, we're gonna make sure nobody has a bad temper. You can't take that out of people, right? You just can't. Uh, how did the reformers propose to achieve their goals or aims? The English Thomas More's Utopia, Utopia, the title means, it, it's almost like saying heaven, but they're not religious. So it's like a ultimate uh, fantasy city that's just the best place to live in the world. Uh, that's what a utopia. So his utopia is an excellent 
Example, the book was meant as a satire, which means a joke and a lesson for society. The people of utopia, Greek meaning of no place. Isn't that interesting? People always use, oh, my community here, we're a utopia. But the actual Greek word means no place. And that's why this was put in the book. It was a joke. Uh, they do not seek wealth because they see no rewards in it. They put their neighbor's welfare ahead of their own, which means I have to help my neighbors. Hmm. Their education continues throughout their entire lives rather than being limited to a few childhood years. All individuals are absolutely equal in powers and status. And they live by reason rather than passion and ignorance. Again, that's another thing. You cannot take passion out of people. Ignorance, you can teach people and they're not ignorant. But passion, I mean, if a person has a passion for flowers, how are you going to just take that out of their system? Leave the flowers alone. We don't want you to be happy. Strange. It was a radical, which means kind of crazy message. Moore was saying that a corrupt and ignorant society, not the individual sinner, was responsible for the sorry state of the world. Adam's sin was not enough to explain humans' plight. I mean, Adam and Eve. The way people lived with one another must be reformed and by humans themselves. Mm, interesting stuff. The best known and most noble-minded of all the Northern humanists was the Dutch Desiderius Erasmus who lived in the late 15th century and early 16th centuries. By his death, his works were being read throughout Europe. His praise of folly, that's the title of his book, was a scorching or burning indictment or case of the so-called wisdom of the world and a plea for a return. Okay, so you know I like to go over sidebars and photos. Here is the famous Thomas More. Uh, the force of character of Sir Thomas More, English statesman and humanist, comes through strongly in this great portrait by Hans Holbein, the Younger. It's quite a long name. The chain of, uh, of office worn, so that's this, by Moore shows that the painting was made between 1529 and 1533. It's pretty good painting, pretty realistic. When he was the Lord Chancellery of King Henry VIII before being executed or killed by the government for resisting Henry's divorce and remarriage to Anne Boleyn. Okay. Well, Yishuan, this brings us to the bottom of 287. So you know where I gotta go. I get that pencil. Okay, got a couple of questions for you on 287. This is question six. Going too long here. Okay, let me see if I can make this a twosie. Yes. In general, the Italian Renaissance was devoted to what? It's a central theme there that's easy for you to write about. Okay. Let me hit seven. Easy, straightforward. You can answer this quickly. Okay, who were the humanists? Now, don't give me get my funny guys in the class that are going to be like, I don't know, Alex or 
the humanist oh yeah there was that new band that they play in hollywood down at the at the club on sunset no um i'm not talking about those humanists okay so let me give you a few to answer those two questions Okay, but are you doing okay on those two? All right. All right, so at least hopefully you've written these down. So let me head over to uh, Racer. Hey, repeating six in general, the Italian Renaissance was devoted to what? What was the theme? What was its? core as they say okay seven who were the humanists just tell me what were they about what did how did they think what was their style okay we'll talk about the band in hollywood okay all right back to the material so we ended down here uh his book well uh desiderus erasmus let's get away from more praise of folly Praise means, uh, you know, you give it respect and folly, unfortunately, means a foolish situation or a foolish endeavor. So it was a scorching or burning indictment of the so-called wisdom of the world, so-called in a plea for a return. That brings us to 288. Two simple virtues, again, a... Christian style of simple virtues, simple things, not the pursuant of uh, glory and fame and wealth and pleasures. Even more influential was his new carefully researched edition of the New Testament. Wow, New Testament Bible with his commentaries and introduction. Erasmus's work has two basic themes, the inner nature of Christianity and the importance of education. So this is kind of a new thing going hand in hand. The original Christianity from the European church, you were not allowed to read the Bible. The priest read it to you. But here he's saying, hey, why don't you put education and Christianity together? What a nice combination, right? By the inner nature of Christianity, he meant that the true follower of Christ should emulate or mimic Christ's life, not what the theologians had tried to make out of his gospels. Erasmus condemned the empty formalism that was so common in the church of his day. So he didn't like church procedure and the way churches did ceremonies and what have you. He didn't like those things. Uh, Erasmus condemned the empty formalism that was so common in the church of his day. So he thought those things were just formal things that were empty of meaning. In so doing, he was one of the most important forerunners or people who started a movement of the Protestant Reformation. Although he absolutely rejected Protestantism for himself and condemned Luther's arrogance. So the person who started Protestantism, which was a breakaway from the Catholic Church, uh, Erasmus said, this guy, Luther, he's arrogant. Wow. A lot of ego stuff going on there. Uh, the political economy of Renaissance Europe. The political theory of the Middle Ages was based on a strong centralizing monarchy or king and queen 
which was blessed and seconded by a powerful and respected clergy, which means the church supported it. The favorite image for government was a man wearing a crown and holding a cross in his left hand and a sword in his right. But in the Hundred Years' War and other late medieval conflicts, that image suffered serious damage. In country after country, the feudal nobility were able to reassert themselves and again decentralize political power. This decentralization was then reversed in the 15th and 16th centuries. The monarchs or kings, now armed with a new theory of authority, effectively denied the nobles claims of autonomy or you can't touch us and subdued their frequent attempts to rebel. The new basis of royal authority was not church and king in partnership, but the king as executive of the secular or non-religious uh, state. A little interesting twist there, right? Uh, so continuing here in the middle, the theory of the state. The state in Renaissance thinking was a political organism or being that existed independently of the ruler of the subject, so independent of the king. It possessed three essential attributes, legitimacy, which means was it true? Sovereignty, which means does it actually have the ability to rule over people and territory. So here we go for further definition. Legitimacy meant that the state possessed moral authority in the eyes of the subjects. It had a right to exist, right? It had a right to exist. That's what makes it legitimate. Next, sovereignty meant that the state had an effective claim to equality with other states and that it acknowledged no higher earthly power over it. Interesting. Territory is self-explanatory. The, uh, what you must call it, the uh, state possessed real estate that could be precisely bounded and contained certain human and material resources. The royal personages was not the creator or owner, again, this means the king, but only the servant, the executive agent and the protector of the state. He had every right and duty to use whatever means he deemed fit to ensure the state's welfare and expansion. In the 15th century, monarch's view ensuring, so that brings us to the bottom of 288. So it's question time. Yes, indeed you do. to question Okay, that looks like a good Tuesday. What was the political theory or belief and how they put it out there of the Middle Ages? Okay, how did they run their politics at that time? Okay, nine, the last question for uh, 288. Do you want me to try to run a, make this a onesie? Let's see. Can I do it? Oh, I did. Uh, what was the state, as we've been reading on this page, in Renaissance thinking? So again, what is their definition of the state? How did they actually have their state? So let me give you a few to do those.
Okay, I guess I'll go for the uh, eraser. Okay, repeating eight, what was the political theory of the Middle Ages? So talk about how they ran things in the Middle Ages. Nine, what was the state in Renaissance thinking? Okay, self-explanatory. Okay. So go back to the material. We finished here in the bottom, monarch's view, ensuring, and that's uh, 288. Here's a nice uh, painting here. Look at that skeleton with a scythe. So this represents death. Death is, where is this thing? Knocking on your door, right? This is per, these people are trying to take care of you. Death and the miser. So miser is a person that just hoards money and money is the most important thing. The Dutchman, Hieronymus Bosch, was the 16th century master of the grotesque and the damned. Here he shows what happens to the treasure of a miser. So the person dying is a miser. As death comes for him and the angel implores him to put faith in the crucified Christ. So the angel saying, please believe in Christ. This is his uh, money that he's hoarded over the years. Monsters, see the little monster here, and thieves make off with his money, right? So what does it matter? You're gonna, here's another monster here trying to take a bag of money and a monster up here, right? So it's like, you're gonna die. You can't take the money with you. Do you wanna go to heaven, right? So the welfare of the state was about the same um, as ensuring the welfare of the society in general. The so-called new monarchs or kings were intent on one great goal, power. Again, like most humans, most humans give in to power and the more power you get, usually the more you want. To be the proper servants of the state, they felt they must be masters of all who might threaten it. And that meant being masters of intrigue, which is like spy technique, deceit, lying and intimidation, which means scaring people into doing something. Either you scare them with violence. All of the Renaissance political theorists spent much time on the relationship between power and ethics, but none had the long-term impact of a young Italian with great ambitions. Niccolo Machiavelli, in his extraordinary treatise or written work on the politics entitled The Prince, 1516, Machiavelli described power relations in government as he had experienced them not as they should be, but as they were in fact. So he was not being politically correct. He was telling the truth. So Machiavelli, he thought that human beings were selfish by nature and must be restrained by the prince from doing evil to one another. In so doing, the prince could and should use all means open to him. He must be both the lion, this is the prince, he must be both the lion and the fox, the one who is feared and the one who is beloved. If it, is, if it came to a choice between instilling fear and love, the wise prince would choose fear, which is more dependable. I don't know if you've heard this one I'm gonna say, but a lot of mafia people will tell you, it is better to be feared than to be loved because people can still do bad things to you if they love you. But if they're afraid of you, they would be afraid to do bad things to you. You know what I mean? Jelly bean. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I'm pretty sure this brings me to the end here. Let's check it out. Yeah, see it went black, so I got to return previous. All right. So let's go here. So I tried to give you just the pertinent information here that you needed, not to go to an extent or too wild on you. So uh, that's it for this week, folks. So hopefully you enjoyed it and uh, take care. Answers are pretty straightforward. And then I will see you next week. Okay, thank you much.